A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. Glad you uh, are with me on the program today. We're going to be talking about, well, we're going to be talking about the failure of a a pro-gun bill in Tennessee, but it is not all bad news. Um, Although I do think this is kind of a growing problem in a lot of pro-gun states. What happens uh, if you are a lawmaker in one of the 29 states that now has constitutional carry on the books and you want to show, and not only show, but you actually want to do something that is going to continue to benefit gun owners in your state. Where do you go? What do you do? I mean, constitutional carry is a pretty big deal, right? So what happens after constitutional carry is in effect? And this is something that I think a lot of legislators are struggling with in pro-gun states. And admittedly, it's a pretty good problem to have, right? Uh, our gun laws are so good, how do we make them even better? But um, it also means that, you know, when we're pushing the envelope, some of these bills uh, are not going to be successful. In Tennessee, for example, there was a bill introduced this year. Um, the headline here, uh, Tennessee bill fails. It would have exempted some people from penalties for taking guns into prohibited areas. It's not quite what the bill was about. But basically, uh, even those properties that were posted as gun-free, um, somebody could go in with their firearm, and it would be up to the specific property owner or maybe one of their employees to recognize that somebody was carrying concealed, to say, hey, we don't allow guns in here. You need to take your gun outside. Uh, and if they did not do that, uh, then you would call law enforcement. They would come up and maybe issue a citation uh, to that concealed carry holder. So the Nashville Area Chamber of Commerce came out and spoke out against this bill. Tennessee Bureau of Investigation spoke out against this bill. Tennessee Department of Public Safety spoke out against this bill. And the bill died in a Senate committee. There is a competing version on the House side that is probably not going to go anywhere. I think there's a hearing scheduled for next week. But uh, now that the Senate has put the kibosh on their own bill, I don't even know if the House is going to try to move forward with their own measure. Um, There were, again, some objections, right, that this infringed on the rights of property owners. Um, There were concerns about uh, public safety that uh, the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation and the Department of Safety brought up. Well, you know, someone could bring a gun into the DMV. And... The sponsor of the Senate bill uh, said this was about really trying to make sure that people could keep a hold of their guns, right? Do you want these folks storing their firearms in their car where they can be stolen, or do you want them to keep their gun on their person? Um, I think it's a valid argument, but it didn't get very far in the Tennessee legislature this year. And this is not an anti-gun body, right? During the special session last year after the Covenant school shooting, Tennessee lawmakers rejected virtually every gun control bill. Uh, but this was a bridge too far, I suspect, for the Chamber of Commerce Republicans, right? The the pro-business Republicans go, well, we don't want to, you know, offend our uh, corporate friends over there. So we'll go ahead and uh, vote this bill down. So where do lawmakers go? What can they do to continue to improve on the gun laws in the 29 states where constitutional carries in effect? I think that lawmakers in Nashville... And I guess lawmakers in Baton Rouge and lawmakers in Columbia, South Carolina, the two most recent constitutional carry states, can take a page from what other pro-gun states are doing around the country. And I want to offer three examples on today's show of areas where I think uh, there is an opportunity to continue to advance the right to keep and bear arms after a constitutional carry law has been put in place. And the first thing I want to talk about is an effort that's underway in Wyoming where the Firearms Research Center uh, was established a couple of years ago. This is housed at the University of Wyoming College of Law. Uh, As the Firearms Center says on its website, it was launched to establish more voices in the firearms discussion, create a pipeline of graduates prepared to serve as firearms lawyers, and act as a reliable nonpartisan resource for firearms-related information. By bringing together scholars from a wide variety of academic disciplines and experts without traditional academic backgrounds, the center says, the aim is to foster a broad discourse and produce meaningful change in how firearms are discussed and understood. This is a counter to things like Johns Hopkins University's Bloomberg-funded School of Public Health or the law clinic established at the University of Minnesota Law School that is uh, aiding uh, anti-gun attorney general Keith Ellison 
uh, in advancing litigation against the firearms industry. Uh, you know, Ellison was one of those attorney generals who sent a demand letter to Glock this week. And he very well may have University of Minnesota Law School students helping him out in this endeavor. They're getting basically uh, free legal help, right? Meanwhile, the law students are getting a uh, crash course in how to be an effective gun control litigator. So the Firearms uh, Center at the University of Wyoming Law School, Firearms Research Center, is a way to counterbalance that. Now, I would say we need more of these. And this is something that the lawmakers in Tennessee absolutely should be investigated. I mean, listen, you've got a pro Second Amendment attorney, uh, Glenn Harlan Reynolds. I believe he is still active at the University of Tennessee Law School. But why doesn't UT have a firearms research center of its own or Middle Tennessee State University or any of the other public education uh, institutions of higher learning in the state. This, to me, seems like a very, very easy step to take and one that would be incredibly beneficial not only to gun owners in Tennessee, but around the country. Uh, frankly, I, I think every one of the 29 constitutional carry states should be looking to do what the University of Wyoming has done so we can start to counteract the anti-gun and anti-Second Amendment ideology that is so ever-present on many college campuses. So that's one area for Tennessee lawmakers to uh, step in and advance our right to keep and bear arms. They could also look at what's going on in Kansas right now, where lawmakers are debating a proposed constitutional amendment to the state constitution that would say specifically, a person has the right to keep and bear arms for the defense of self family, home, and state, for lawful hunting and recreational use, and for any other lawful purpose. And such right includes the possession and use of ammunition, firearm accessories, and firearm components. But standing armies in times of peace are dangerous to liberty and shall not be tolerated, and the militaries will be in strict subordination to the civil power. The proposed amendment goes on to say the right to keep and bear arms is a natural and fundamental right. This right shall not be infringed. Any restriction of such right shall be subject to the strict scrutiny standard. Now, Tennessee does have a provision in its state constitution protecting the right to keep and bear arms. But it can be a lot stronger. Um, Article 1, Section 24 of the Constitution of Tennessee states that the sure and certain defense of a free people is a well-regulated militia. And as standing armies in time of peace are dangerous to freedom, they ought to be avoided as far as the circumstances and safety of the community will admit, and that in all cases the military shall be kept in strict subordination to the civil authority. That doesn't explicitly talk about an individual right to keep and bear arms. Article 1, Section 26 of the Tennessee State Constitution provides, quote, that the citizens of this state have a right to keep and bear arms for their common defense, but the legislature shall have power by law to regulate the wearing of arms with a view to prevent crime. Again, I don't know about you, I see some room for improvement there. Uh, especially when you consider and compare it to the proposed language that's being debated in Kansas right now. A couple of years ago, Iowa also revised its right to keep and bear. Actually, it, 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 it included a right to keep and bear arms provision in the state constitution. One did not previously exist. And it, too, addressed strict scrutiny. It, too, uh, talked about an explicit individual right to keep and bear arms. And it was approved in Iowa, by the way, by about a two-thirds vote of the people. I expect the same will be the case if this uh, Kansas amendment comes up for a vote later this year as well. So there's another area. Change the Tennessee state constitution to more explicitly protect and safeguard our right to keep and bear arms. Again, that's something I think would meet with wide approval across the state of Tennessee. And uh, frankly, given the current language of the state constitution, it would be a huge improvement and a big benefit to gun owners in the volunteer state. The last effort that I would suggest to lawmakers in Tennessee, if they're looking for something good to do on guns, is a bill that was introduced in Georgia this year. Now, I will confess, I don't know that this bill in Georgia is going to fare any better than the bill that just went down to defeat in Tennessee. But I think that it is a, I, I, I think it, it, it tries to get to the same endpoint it just goes about it in a slightly different way. State Representative uh, Martin uh, Momton uh, introduced this bill, House Bill 1364, that says any lawful weapons carrier who's prohibited from carrying and who is injured in one of these gun-free zones 
shall have a cause of action against the person, business, or other entity that owns or legally controls such property. In other words, hey, listen, if you want to ban guns from your property, cool, that's your right as a property owner. But if you're going to prevent a lawful gun owner from carrying in self-defense on your property, then their safety now is your responsibility. And if they're harmed when they could have protected themselves with that legally carried firearm, well, you're going to be on the hook. You're liable for what happened to them. Again, I, I, I'm sure the Chamber of Commerce types would object just as much to this bill. But again, this allows property owners the full flower of their rights, right? You don't want to have guns on your property? Fine. Ban them. Tell people they can't bring them in. But again, there's that common sense corollary to that. If you're telling me I can't protect myself on your property, well, who's responsible for my safety? You are. Would this lead to fewer gun-free zones? Probably. Uh, I'm sure that there would still be some anti-Second Amendment stalwarts who would say, oh, fine, I'll assume that risk. But I, I guess a, I'm guessing a lot of business owners would say, all right, yeah, I don't want to. Nah, that's fine. You can carry your firearm here. So I think that it would get to um, the same goal. It would have ultimately the same result as what they were trying to do in Tennessee. It's just an approach that I think maybe is a little bit more uh, property rights friendly. Um, it's certainly something where the Chamber of Commerce types they would have a, a more difficult time arguing against it. What, so you're saying you shouldn't be responsible for somebody's safety if you tell them they can't protect themselves? Really? How do you justify that? I, I'd love to see that debate in Nashville. I hope we get to see that debate uh, in Georgia this year, too. But uh, so far, the uh, representative bill has not really been on a fast track uh, to the governor's desk. But again, the point behind all of these suggestions is that uh, just because constitutional carry is now the law of the land in 29 states doesn't mean that they've reached the end point of pro-Second Amendment legislation. Um, there are still areas where they can improve state law. And I think these are a couple of areas that would offer major, major improvements. Again, particularly the idea of these academic institutions that are not anti-gun. They're not designed to uh, facilitate more gun control. They are instead designed to facilitate the exercise of a fundamental civil right. University of Wyoming Law Center and the uh, Farms Research Center is doing great work, but we need a dozen. We need two dozen. We need 29 of these research centers, maybe 290 of these research centers all across the country in public institutions. And this is something that uh, I, I hope that we'll see more of, including in Tennessee going forward. All right, let's turn our attention now to today's Armed citizen story, our good deed of the day, and our recidivist report. We'll start there with a story out of Arizona. Advocates call for Arizona probation reform after convicts harm others while on probation. Yeah, what's interesting about this is who the advocate in question is, at least the advocate who spoke to Arizona's family. Um. This uh, former probation officer, Beth Goulden, spent 24 years working in the Maricopa County Adult Probation Department, and she says the system has some problems. Uh, most recently, we saw the death of, well, not, not most recently, but recently, we saw the death of a, a hiker, Lauren Heike, who was killed in Phoenix last year. Uh, her alleged killer, Zion William Teasley, had met with his probation officers days after uh, the stabbing. You had a uh, line of shooting death in 2021. Phoenix police officer uh, Tyler Moldovan, uh, his suspected killer, a convicted felon named uh, Essa Williams, was on probation for theft. And Goulden says that stories like this, tragedies like these, show that the system needs more accountability and more transparency. According to Arizona family, she's noticed an alarming pattern. Earlier this month, a man named Timothy Guan was accused of trying to grab a 14-year-old girl on her walk home from school in Glendale, Arizona. Guan, at the time, on probation for similar crimes. Also this month, Arizona family reports investigators say a drunk driver caused a deadly crash that threw a three-year-old boy from the car, killed his mother, 
Police say that the driver, guy by the name of Dre Lewis, was behind the wheel and was on probation for aggravated assault. It was not supposed to be uh, using drugs or alcohol at the time. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Golden says there's no way that any of us can control human behavior. But she adds, there are things that you can actively do to supervise someone. So those are the questions that I would say we want answers to. Were they being actively supervised? And that's a great question to ask, because how many stories have we seen and covered here on Cam and Company where somebody's supposedly on intensive supervision, right, intensive probation, they've got their ankle monitor, they're supposed to be reporting into their probation officer on a weekly basis, they end up cutting that ankle monitor and nothing happens. For them, anyway, right? They get to go on leading their life. No APB is put out. There's, there's no, uh, you know, check in. Weeks go by, and maybe a warrant gets put out for their arrest, but that's it, right? In some cases, you've got people on probation who are just letting the batteries on their GPS monitor die because it's their responsibility to ensure that the GPS monitor is working as it's supposed to. So, yeah, even a simple step like. When you meet with your probation officer, the probation officer changes the batteries in your GPS monitor would be a step above what exists in a lot of probationary systems. Beth Goulden wonders, what is the Arizona Probation Department doing to keep the community safe? She wants the uh, statistics to be audited. She wants to know who's looking at these statistics. Uh, okay, so individuals who are you know under heightened probation standards have to undergo drug testing. Uh, they receive, you know, increased home-based contact. They're monitored for treatment participation. Again, how often does that monitoring take place? What happens when somebody violates their probation? Do they get a slap on the wrist? Is their original sentence imposed? There are all kinds of questions here. And again, in Arizona anyway, some of those questions are spurred by the fact that you've got people who are supposedly being monitored who are accused of some very heinous crimes. Now, today's Armed citizen story, I uh, believe this is from Tennessee, but uh, let me just make sure about that. Yep, indeed, uh, Harrison, Tennessee, uh, where a, a home invasion led to one suspect being shot, two suspects still on the run, according to uh, local authorities. Preliminary investigation reveals that uh, three suspects broke into this home in Harrison, uh, confronted by the homeowner, according to the sheriff's department in uh, Hamilton County, one of the suspects was shot during the exchange of gunfire, died at the scene. Two other suspects then jumped through a window to get away from that armed homeowner and uh, fled the scene. Uh, the sheriff's office says the identities of those involved being withheld pending further investigation. So we don't even have any details about who these suspects are. Uh, the homeowner, however, says that this was the second night in a row that his home had been broken into. Uh, neighbors on the street uh, Tuesday morning said that they've considered the place to be a safe neighborhood. They, uh, One of them told a, a local TV reporter that, quote, I still can't believe it happened, not once, but twice in a row. Um, and again, don't know if the suspects here were looking for somebody or something in particular. And that's why that home was targeted two nights in a row. Maybe they just thought, uh, you know, th this is an easy mark. We uh, broke in once. Didn't get shot at, so we can go back and uh, break in again. Whatever their rationale, it did not turn out well for the uh, three home invaders. One of them, again, fatally shot at the scene. Two others now on the run. Going to be facing serious charges, including potentially murder charges, uh, for the death of their accomplice when and if they are taken into custody. Finally today, our good deed of the day, in the right place, at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing. Neighbors. In a uh, uh, Florida town, Fort Myers, who uh, came to the aid of one of their own, their house caught on fire. Howard, your house is on fire. That is something you never, ever want to hear. Uh, Travis Adams lives in Fort Myers. He was actually, uh, actually, he's in town for spring training. Uh, he's heading to uh, Kansas, I guess, uh, or now in Kansas. Uh, but he was there in Fort Myers over the weekend. It was a Monday night. Said he didn't know about his neighbor, Howard, or his house until he heard a bang on Monday afternoon. And then he ran to his friend's window uh, in the home and looked outside. Adam says his friend said, uh, dude, the house across the street's on fire. So I looked over and I ended up just running out of the house. 
So ran across the street to see if anybody was inside. Adam says, uh, no one knew whether anybody was in there. So me and the guy went to the front door and we started knocking on it. And someone had to break in the front window. And I think they knew who was in there because he was yelling, Howard, your house is on fire. Get out. Adams says the next thing he knew, um, they were trying to get Howard extricated out of that home. He said it proved to be pretty difficult. There were a lot of things blocking the doorway. He said we couldn't get in, so we had to go around. I saw there was another door, door on the side. He said I ended up tearing a little bit of the fence down to get back there. And then we ended up getting the door open and kind of moving some stuff out of the way of the door and getting them out. He said, my goal was to just help him out of the house because I didn't know how much the house was on fire. What was on fire? He said, I just saw a big old blaze on and fire and smoke coming from the home. Uh, there were eventually three other neighbors besides Adams who ran inside to save the resident, Howard. Adams says he doesn't think of himself as a hero. But uh, I think, again, for all of these individuals to do this, before the fire department had arrived, before there were any first responders on scene, they were the first responders. And they were able to get Howard out of the home without serious injury. Fire officials confirmed that the uh, cause of the fire was a, a problem with the uh, electrical system inside the home. Um, don't know how much of the uh, house was damaged, but uh, thankfully Howard is okay. And uh, just a you know reminder, probably not an issue for uh, most folks, but do make sure that uh, you know your entrances and exits are clear and not covered up in case you do need to make a, a quick escape because of a fire. That uh, fact that uh, they couldn't get through the front door there might have had deadly consequences uh, if it were not for the quick thinking of a uh, young Mr. Adams in town for uh, spring training. So Travis Adams and the uh, other neighbors there in Fort Myers, Florida, who came to Howard's aid, we thank you for your very, very good deed. All right, that is all the time we've got for you on this at Barry and Arms Cam and Company. We will be back with you tomorrow with another episode. Looking forward to talking to you then. Be sure to check out BarryandArms.com. In the meantime, we're updating the website throughout the day with all of the latest Second Amendment news and information. Good news for my home state of Virginia, where Governor Glenn Youngkin has vetoed more than two dozen gun control measures. Got some uh, interesting news out of Louisiana, too. Lawmakers, they're not stopping with constitutional carry. Nope, they are continuing to expand the uh, right to bear arms. We've got updates on uh, that for you as well at Bearing Arms and a whole lot more. If you like what you see, I'd encourage you to become a VIP or VIP Gold member. Just go to bearingarms.com slash subscribe. Use the promo code SAVEAMERICA, all one word, and you can get a significant savings on your VIP or VIP Gold membership. Not only will you get exclusive content you won't find anywhere else, news stories and analysis, opinions that matter, you get that warm, fuzzy feeling of knowing that you're supporting the independent pro segment of journalism we're doing at Bearing Arms. We truly do appreciate your support. Have a great rest of your hump day Wednesday. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Until then, be well, be safe, almost made it, and be free.